It's very easy, I think, to feel that you don't matter. That what you do and what you say doesn't matter. To feel that there is a pointlessness to everything. That feeling of what, what does it matter, what, what I do? Nothing can change, nothing will change. What I am, what I do, what I bring, it's hardly worth it. It's of little value. What's the point? I suspect with so many overwhelming concerns around us at the moment, such feelings and thoughts are probably with us more than we want them to. Who can stand in the faces of these challenges of climate change, of companies that control energy, of governments which fail us? Who can look in the horrors and the violence and cruelty that rage across our worlds, in Ukraine, in Iraq, in so many places, who can look at the inhumanities of immigration centres in our own country and the language of hatred that is used, the falsehoods and the lies of those in power or who have been in power. Who can not look all this in the face and feel that our voice does not matter, that we do not matter, that we cannot change things? Who struggles to feel the value of what they do when there is so much around us that screams out, people do not matter? And I've asked myself, in coming to this part of John's vision in Revelation, I've asked, face a lot of difficult words, difficult visions. I've asked, where is the comfort of God here? Where is the good news of the gospel? Where is the wisdom and delight of the Lord in what I'm reading it? And in the face of it, these verses are hard. But when I ask that question, there is a different way of reading the vision. One which speaks to those feelings of nothing mattering anymore. I am aware of events and lives across our church community just now where life is both feeling very precious and yet very fragile. Where the psalmist cry can easily come from our lips. My soul is in deep anguish. How long, Lord, how long? In Psalm 6, verse 3. And this part of the vision speaks an answer to that cry. What you do matters. How you live matters. What you say matters, even if there is so much in the world that lies around us that says it doesn't. There is a harvest. This part of John's vision carries two harvests. The grain harvest and the grape harvest. The grain harvest speaks of the things that matter towards the harvest. The grape harvest speaks of the promise that what is wrong will be faced down. I will speak this morning to the grain harvest, the first of these harvests in the text, and come soon to the second harvest. These two harvests point towards the promise of Revelation 21 that we will come to soon. And I want to share that big end picture with you just to see where we're going with this. Revelation 21, verse 2 to 4, say this. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for our husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. He will dwell with them. They will be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more mourning or crying or pain. All that has passed away. That is the promise. For those who are in the midst of the witness, the promise of the harvest is the promise that what you do now matters. What you say and do now has value and is not worthless. And one day you will be where God wipes the tears away and your mourning and lament is past. That day will come. Two harvests. Jesus speaks often of harvests. It is a picture that is in the lips of those he speaks to. It's structured into their lives and their feasts and their celebrations. Whole way of life for those who hear Jesus speak is structured around harvest. Setting at the fields, planting, caring, growing, tending, watering, protecting, letting what is planted grow so that it will sustain them and sustain others, feed others. Lives are lived in this rhythm of living and it's plants grow, flourish, harvest, celebrate, plant, 
grow, flourish, harvest, celebrate. There is a rhythm to living like that that our lives mask. We can go to a shop, we can pick up what we need, get raspberries in the middle of December. We can do that. Our lives mask lives that lead towards harvest. But those that Jesus speaks to, those John speaks to, they know of harvests. Back in Deuteronomy, when God is setting out the structure for his people towards the year, it's about harvest. And this word comes here in Deuteronomy 16. It says, God says to his people, be joyful at your festivals. You, your sons, your daughters, your male and female servants, the Levites, the foreigners, fatherless, the widows who live in your towns, all these people come and celebrate the festival, the harvest, for your Lord God will bless you in the harvest and all the work of your hands. Your joy will be complete in harvests. Harvesting is a time filled with joy, with relief. There is a welcoming of all, a celebrating together. And he says, let the joy of this harvest flow. In the days before COVID, we used to go to the world buffet places. Sometimes you walk in there and the the food is overflowing. And you can't believe I can take that and that and that. It's overflowing the foods. Come in and share the harvest. Enjoy the harvest. Harvest is meant to be joyful. A gathering of what has been worked for and cared for and protected and growing. But harvests begin in darkness. Jesus speaks of the planting that will bring a harvest. He says, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, if it dies, it produces many seeds in John 12, 24. Here Jesus speaks of himself, the cross, his death, given so that we might live, so that we might be alive to God. Jesus is raised to life that we might live to glorify God in the lives that we live out of his harvest. Jesus in his death plants seeds into our darkness of God's grace and forgiveness and love. And the harvest of Revelation 14, the green harvest, begins in the planting of the seeds that are given in the death of Jesus Christ. This is the harvesting. The celebrating of the seeds planted in our lives by the death and resurrection of Jesus. In Revelation so far, at the heart of all of it, is witness. The letters that go out to the churches in the opening chapters, they're calling in these churches, hold to your witness. The middle section from chapter 4 on places John in the throne room of God to see the victory of Jesus, the victory of the Lamb that was slain. And for me, much of John's vision pivots around chapter 11. That vision, you remember, of the two witnesses sent out into the outer part of the temple. Dangerous part of the temple. Here is the beginnings of the vision that is seen across the chapters we've been with in these recent weeks. The two witnesses who are in the outer courts. A picture of holding witness to the Lamb who is slain and yet lives. Holding to that witness in a place that doesn't recognize the victory of Jesus. In chapters 12 to 14 we see vision after vision of what it means to witness to Jesus' victory in the cross and resurrection when all around you says no. The consequence in John's world is that people die when they witness to Jesus. The call to witness throughout Revelation is not simply to take someone for a coffee although that's a very nice thing and I'm always open to that. But that's not witness in Revelation. To witness to Jesus, to his victory over pain, over suffering, over violence and over injustice to the world, to keep witnessing to that takes you into the places where your life is in danger because the witness matters and makes a difference. And you matter in that witness. There is a harvest A moment when that victory of Jesus on the cross through the resurrection overcomes the loss and the pain and the injustices of the world that lies around us. And the new creation is coming and you hear God's words, well done, good and faithful servants. There is a harvest moment after the planting in darkness, after all the growing of God's, after the caring and the pruning 
and the protecting. There is a moment of harvest, of gathering, of celebrating. There is a gathering of witnesses, a moment, a moment when truth holds against the world. And the call of the gospel is to live to Jesus in witness. When Jesus calls the disciples, it is with this simple call, follow me. And they follow. And in their own broken and faltering ways, maybe, Peter springs to mind often, but they follow. John's vision makes the same call to follow, not in these exciting, tense-filled days of the first years of Jesus' ministry around Galilee, but to keep following after Jesus has been led to the cross, to follow after the nails have pierced his hands, to follow after the cry of forsakenness has gone up, to follow when he is laid in the tomb and to follow when the tomb is empty. John's vision calls us to follow after the gift of the Spirit at Pentecost, to follow in the way of Jesus. When that witness damages us and leads us to the outside places of chapter 11 as witnesses, to the wilderness places of chapter 12, where we witness not in the the sun-filled waters of Galilee where Jesus is face to face with me, but in the sodden, rain-filled streets of Glasgow, in the face of what the world is now, and to witness knowing that what I say and do matters. And this, this is the glory of John's vision. With all its difficulties, with all the, the wrestling with the images, this is the glory of it. That our witness matters. And that when we live to the gift of Jesus, when we witness to his words, words like, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Words like, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Words like, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, they will be satisfied. Then there is a harvesting of that witness. A moment when, yes, the kingdom does belong to those whom others have set aside. Yes, there is a moment when God will wipe the tears from my eyes. Yes, there is a moment when justice comes against all the pain and all the suffering and all the hatreds of the world. There is a moment when that is. Mother shared on, in the last few days on her daughter and she says that it feels like her daughter is bigger than the world can take her. She wrote this, my daughter is eight years old. She is extraordinary. And I don't use that word lightly. She is powerful, determined, clever, and extremely attuned. She is also eight years old. Turns out the world we've designed finds it hard to tolerate little girls who are perceptive, have strong opinions, are loud about them, and in general aren't frightened of much. She goes on, my daughter has been put on a staged intervention at school because she can't quite tolerate the environment she's being asked to live in. She doesn't quite fit in the world that we've designed. And the mother says, I feel like yelling, put the system on a staged intervention, not my eight-year-old child. She's the one who gets it. She is precious. She is hope. And that seems to me such a powerful statement that places people, and all the differences, people at the heart of making the world. And for many, it is the world that needs the staged intervention. If we are witnesses to Jesus, then we don't quite fit in the world that others have designed. The good news of Jesus places people at the heart of the world as those who care for God and care for neighbor. I justly, love mercy, walk humbly with God. Live like this so that merciful peacemakers make a difference even as they suffer for the witness to Jesus. God places a harvest over our lives because this is the way the world changes. Our witness matters. We are planted by God. 
grown and cared for by our Saviour, so that each, of, uh, each one of us gets it. We know that we are precious. We know that we bring hope. And you matter in saying that to others. This is the way the world has changed. Witness and trusting in the harvest. Shall we pray?